Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My wife and I were driving down 169 uh, a couple weeks ago. And um, as we were driving down the highway, um, above one of the overpasses, uh, there was a woman standing up there alone, right in the middle of the bridge. She had in her hand a yellow, a great big yellow and blue flag that she had draped over the side of the overpass for everyone driving underneath to see. I have to confess, I'm, I'm a little ashamed of the fact that I did not recognize the Ukrainian flag until about three weeks ago. I didn't even know what it looked like. And there are so many people that have this dual citizenship who are affected by the war in Ukraine and have family or friends or people overseas that, that are, are really suffering. And it's amazing that, that these, these people walked among us unknown. Unknown, that is, until their homeland came under attack. And it's in that moment when their homeland comes under siege that they let their true colors fly. They're not afraid of showing where they belong and, and what their real citizenship is. For you and I, we are citizens of two kingdoms at the same time. We live in this world. We are part of this world. And yet, at the same time, you and I have a citizenship in heaven. A kingdom that is under siege. Today, the Holy Spirit comes to us and asks us that challenging question, Who are you? Where does your true citizenship lie? Where do you live as a child of the resurrection? Who are you? Today we answer this question with these words from Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 4, verse 1. I invite you to stand as we read as follows in Jesus' name. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before now, before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. We bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, these are your words. We pray that you make us holy by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Please be seated. Food is an important way of expressing our nationality. For instance, I'm German, so that means I love sauerkraut and eating weird things like beef tongue and, and stuff like that. But I married a, a wonderful lady who's both Swedish and Norwegian. And what that meant is when we got married, 
I had to sit down around the family table, and every single one of her uncles were watching me as I took my first bite of lutefisk. If I wanted to belong, I had to eat the family food. I did eat it, by the way. It was good. <laughs> food is an important way of expressing our nationality. It's true for us today. It was true in Paul's day back in this time. Paul is writing these words to uh, a Roman colony called Philippi. And this Roman city was full of retired veterans uh, who were retired from the Roman military. And one of the one of the aspects of Roman culture that was very well known that Paul kind of hints at here in these verses, one of their aspects of, of their culture was that they enjoyed to eat. They would have these lavish, lavish parties that would last through the night. would just be eating and drinking. And, and, and course after course after course would be served. And so you would eat and eat and eat and eat until you had your fill. And then you would purge. Then you'd go back to the table and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat until you had your fill. Then you purge. Binging, and purging. Binging, and purging. And what's interesting is this had a, there was a spiritual aspect to this eating, these feasts. And that was the Roman way of, of celebrating life. You know, they, they, they said that eating food was kind of the pinnacle, enjoying food was the pinnacle of life and the pinnacle of human experience. And by doing this over and over and over again, they were warding off death. So that's what Paul is mentioning when he says, their God is their stomach. And he says in, in, in tears, he says, um, I, I'm brought to the point of tears because many are living as enemies of the cross of Christ. And he's not talking about unbelievers, he's talking about believers, people who are Christians, who are living as enemies of the cross of Christ because they're embracing this, this entirely worldly, this entirely carnal point of view, this, this spiritual point of view, that that's how you ward off death. Worshiping your stomach. How do we embrace life today? What's the pinnacle of, of living for us? What are, what are the things that we, we binge and, and purge on? Maybe it is that salty sweet something. You know, when life is out of control, sometimes just reaching for that snack is one way that we feel like we can take control back, or that, that feeling of a full stomach can make us feel full at a time in our life when, when I'm empty and I'm searching and I'm hungry for something. Maybe it's the bottle after bottle, can after can, Drink after drink. That's the only thing that can that really silence that negative voice inside our head so that we can actually have a good time and, and relax. Maybe it's shopping. You know, finding that control in my life. I, just one more outfit, one more pair of shoes, then I'll be happy, then I'll be satisfied. Is it the content online that we'd be ashamed of if other people saw what we were doing? Or maybe it's that latest season of Netflix that just came out and I binge and binge and binge and well, binge watching because I just can't get enough. Or that never ending scrolling on social media. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Always hungry for something else. Hungry for one more laugh. 
And what's interesting about these things is so often we recognize that maybe this isn't good and, and we have a negative feeling about ourselves because I do this thing and I can't help it. So we, we purge. We say, all right, I'm done with this. I'm, I'm putting the phone away. I, I'm putting the food away. I'm changing my life for good now. It's, it's I'm done. I'm walking away. We purge. Then we go right back to it and hate ourselves even more. God in our stomach. When we're just led by our desire, and when our desire is just whatever it is I crave in this life, and that's where I find satisfaction, that's what gives my life meaning, that's how I ward off death. And as Christians today, we also have to be cautious of, am, am I living as an enemy of the cross of Christ? Is, is my life confessing that, or is, is my life giving the impression that I'm just living for this world and living for these things right now. Meanwhile, the, the one thing, the one relationship that really grants eternal peace, that really truly wards off death, I ignore. I treat like it's not very valuable. Today, the Apostle Paul first puts a foot in front of you, your citizenship. Who am I? You are a citizen of heaven, eagerly awaiting the return of your Savior, Jesus. And he paints a picture before our eyes, and the Bible paints a picture of heaven before our eyes. In Revelation 7, God promises, never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. Or in Revelation 21, God says, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. As wonderful and as beautiful and fulfilling as that, that picture of heaven, that picture of your true homeland is, heaven isn't enough. Heaven isn't enough. It wasn't enough for God. The God who lives in heaven and lives in that paradise says, heaven is empty and void and meaningless without you in it. That God, in heaven, the one thing he craved more than anything else, the one thing he hungered for more than anything else, was an eternal relationship with you. He hungered for that so desperately. Jesus came to this world and lived as a foreigner and alien here. Jesus suffered and died on the cross. Jesus endured the, the pains of hunger and faced the temptations we face every day and overcame them. And that's why Jesus chooses the cross as his banner, because it's a symbol of his victory and the symbol of your victory. And your Lord Jesus Christ promises you that he is the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And he satisfies that deep craving, that deep hunger in our soul for God. And that relationship with, with just a simple piece of bread and a simple little sip of wine. God comes to you. God promises you your sins are forgiven. God gives you the strength to face another day. Paul says as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We are looking forward to Last day when Jesus does return to come to bring us home to heaven. Well, Paul mentioned something else is going to happen to you on that day. And our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power that enables him to subdue all things, will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious, heavenly body. And Paul puts before our eyes this, this moment in time when, when on the last day after the dead are raised, God will, 
in a blink of an eye, transform our body so that no longer will we have to deal with a sinful mind or sinful flesh. We'll, we'll be forever uh, beautiful, forever changed with a heavenly, glorious body. That's the image of the future you he puts in front of you today. Whenever we ask that question, who, who am I? We like to focus on what, what are the patterns, what are the, the molds, what are the things that have left a deep impression on me and my life? And so often when it comes to things that are negative about ourselves that we don't like, we have a way of pushing that off and, and trying to cast the blame on something or someone else. For instance, I'm this way because mom and dad raised me this way. I was born this way. God made me this way. It's my environment that made me this way. It's the trauma. It's the past. We have a way of pushing things away from us. And what this does is it gives us and it can give us a sense that I am just a victim. I'm a helpless victim being shaped and, and molded by everything else happening around me. I, I can't control myself. That's one of the devil's lies. He wants us to feel the helpless victim. He wants us to feel like we're, we're powerless over these things pressing against us in our life. And that's not true. He wants us to give up the battle so that he has the freedom to shape us and mold us in his image. And as, as a child of God, as a citizen of heaven, I have to categorically reject that. I am not just a victim. And Christ gives you power. He gives you strength to overcome <coughs> One of the things that I've, I've uh, appreciated and, and someone else had told to me is that when you're in these moments, like the, the fork in the road, you're in these moments where you're dealing with temptation, or even when you're dealing, wrestling with just uh, human impulses, a way of kind of stepping outside of the situation is, is just imagine like a, an older version of you, you know, someone that's maybe 10 years older, 20 years older, 30 years older, coming to you and talking to you today about the impact of that little decision that you make. Can you imagine what that would look like? You know, at an older version of you saying, well, how will this affect your marriage? How will this change your relationship with your kids? An older version of, of, of you coming back in time to say, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe it's a tough battle today to get the kids to church, to bring the kids to Sunday school. But think about down the road, the impact of those little battles can have on, on your child down the road. And just think about how those battles today to bring your kids here to God's house will have enormous payoff in the future, even in eternity. The older version of you saying, it is worth the struggle. Or imagine an older version of you coming, coming there and, and saying, yeah, you know, I, I realize that this temptation in front of me today just seems like a little compromise. That's the way the devil always sells it. It's just a little compromise. It's nothing big. But that older version of you saying, Look at the big picture. This is, a, this is a battle for your heart. This is a battle for your soul. And it's a battle where the devil has invaded and he's trying to gain ground and every little inch matters. It's not today's battle, it's tomorrow's battle or, or the temptation 10, 15 years down the road. Struggle is worth it. Stand your ground. Or today, the Apostle Paul puts the you that has victory. You, know, you might tell yourself, oh yeah, ten years down the road, I might be in heaven. Well, this is the you that is eternally glorified. The you who has been given a, a glorified body, 
a, a body that is freed from trauma, freed from the chains of the past, freed from sin, freed from a sinful mind and sinful body, eternally beautiful, eternally glorious, coming to you saying, it is worth it. Stand firm. Jesus Christ by the power that enables him to subdue all things to himself will one day transform your lowly body to be like his body. And that's not just something that's going to happen in the future one day, but that's happening now. That's happening every day as, as you confess your sins and go to Christ and return to your baptism. Paul tells you you are buried with Christ through baptism into death. That Jesus, who, who subjected himself to the mold or the, 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 the prison of, of death and broke free glorious, gives you the power day by day to rise with him and to walk with him. And even though we'll never be perfect in this life, We'll always have to wrestle with sin, as long as we breathe. But that's not an excuse. It's an encouragement to look forward. To look forward every day when we wake up to wrap ourselves in the flag of Jesus' righteousness. Every day I ask myself, who am I? I am a citizen of heaven. A child of the resurrection. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.